Usually, in most forms of popular music, artifice and pretension are seen as bad things. We crave authenticity. The relation of experience and the presentation by an authentic self. As a general rule, no one likes a performer who uses music as a costume and appears behind masks, unless you are Kiss or MF Doom. Which is remarkable then that an artist as pretentious and actorly as Tom Waits should have generated such a devoted cult and such vehement adoration and perception of near infallibility because he has acted, improvised and dumb showed his way through 17 albums, some excellent, some worthy, some literate and entertaining and very, very few disappointing ones. Let's look at that catalogue worst to best and this was not an easy task. Number 17, The Black Rider from 1993. Okay, this one was easy. Written for an artsy play, the music is aggressively weird and there's just nothing there to relax and get into. For the most part as well, it is dry and utterly humorless. There are many artists, I guess, with a worse, worst album, but this one is just Tom being a little bit too much Tom-like. A six-year gap followed before his next album. 16. Alice from 2002. Released as a bookend with Blood Money, Blood Money got all the good songs and Alice got the faint resemblance to Black Rider. Tabletop Joe and We're All Mad here pass muster, but the rest, which is far from awful, is a consistent mix of songs that you struggle to remember half an hour after you hear them. At number 15, it's Closing Time from 1973. I'm going to get killed for this. The lower reaches of the countdown will weight a little heavier with Waits' early records, in no small part due to the fact that his record label Asylum and he were engaged in a tug of war, the label who wanted a folk rocker and an artist who wanted to be a saloon singer. Lead single All 55 was covered by the Eagles, who no doubt paid his rent for a few years, but apart from that in the next track, I hope that I don't fall in love with you, Grapefruit Moon and Martha, there isn't much here else to recommend. 1977's Foreign Affairs is in at 14. Waits had a concept. He wanted to make an album like a film noir. Alas, Asylum also had a concept. Sell some damn albums or find a new label. Small Change having made number 89, his first Hot 100 album. Giving us one of his best ever songs in Burma Shave, neither was delivered. It's an album of background music, overlong songs, and a lack of spark from Waits himself. 13, Nighthawks at the Diner, 1975. Another album based on a concept, this one delivers better because Waits finally has the band he wants and the live in the studio approach suited both the material and Waits' groovy extemporization. Whether or not it's a double album worth of material, your mileage may vary, but it is kind of fun for as long as you can stand it. Number 12, Heart Attack and Vine, 1980. A considerable backslide from the wonderful Blue Valentines, Waits goes for a mix between his sentimental balladry and some songs based on a bluesier guitar sound. And some of the songs are great. Saving All My Love For You, On The Nickel, Till The Money Runs Out, and even Jersey Girl. But songs like the title track, Mr. Siegel, and especially the instrumental in Shades, why is this track to side one if you have a long, pointless instrumental bury it at the end of side one? are either interminable or seem that way, and Waits' voice, which is evolving into his trademark 80s croak, is only halfway there and he seems at times to have difficulty controlling it. Despite peeking its nose into the top 100, it was Splitsville for Waits and Asylum after this. Number 11, Real Gone, 2004. A difficult, difficult record. Real Gone comes across as either an album full of good ideas done wrong, or Waits deliberately trying to provoke his audience by pushing so much of the album to the extreme. The absence of keyboards is what grabs you first, then the presence of electronics and turntablism grabs you next. Even with the songs as stripped back as these, Waits still pushes everything up into your face. A number of the songs are just a little too long to avoid overstaying their provocative welcome. It's a slog to get through, for the occasional moments of growth and the odd charm left lying about. Dead and Lovely is Roy Orbison meets Nick Cave's Murder Ballads. 
Make It Rain is rightfully beloved amongst fans. Don't Go Into That Barn has its moments, and against the flow of popular opinion, I like Top of the Hill, with its electronics and incoherent lyrics. When it lacked the home comforts of mule variation, it was a template for the distant but subsequent Bad As Me, where Wait gets what he's going for right. In at number 10, it is The Heart of Saturday Night from 1974. A big step up from the debut, Waits finally beds down his beat poet via 1958 Sinatra persona and brings a solid set of songs, some quite good. The rest may be not spectacular, but they work in the spirit of the record. New Coat of Paint, Depot Depot, Diamonds on My Windshield, Drunk on the Moon, the title track, and the decidedly odd Shiver Me Timbers are all winners. 1976 borders number nine, Small Change. This is the album which best represents the early stage of Waits' career. It features some very good songs indeed. Jitterbug Boy, I Wish I Was in New Orleans, Bad Liver and a Broken Heart, The Piano Has Been Drinking, Invitation to the Blues, I Can't Wait to Get Off Work, and the wonderful Tom Trowbert's Blues, his longtime concert closer. Enjoyable from Go to Woe, the only drawback here is it does sound a bit reheated at times. 8. Bad As Me from 2011 An album that is hard work in places but great reward for that work. A short form tour of vintage Americana by dirt road blues, gospel and rockabilly. Waits still playing odd angles with percussion and his voice is dense and at times bellowing beneath a woolly production. All in all it sounds like music from a distant world and it is the distant world of the past. 2002's Blood Money comes in at number seven. The bookend album to Alice, Blood Money is an altogether more satisfying record. Waits said of it that we all love bad news from a pretty mouth, and this collection, a reflection of the perfidy of man, seems to oblige. The opener, Misery is the River of the World, would have been right at home on Swordfish Trombone. Everything Goes to Hell is more rain dogsy with its demented rumba beat. Coney Island Baby is sweet, well, at least as sweet as anything in this set can be. And All the World is Green is almost croon, or as close as that comes with Tom Waits. And God's Way on Business goes back to Swordfish Trombone with its ramshackle shuffle, and certainly much better defined than the forgettable Alice. A wonderful album in which Waits buried his past and made provision for his future. Not a weak song to be had, and led by the fantastic Christmas card for a walker in Minneapolis, Waits finds his signature voice and finally, by externalising his focus, learns how to write characters into songs. From his oft-criticised version of Somewhere, which I think is terrific, to the LA street apocalypse of A Sweet Little Bullet, Waits' songs stay focused, determined and propulsive. It does make the backflip on the subsequent Heart Attack and Vine seem out of place, although consider them both sides of the same coin that led to Swordfish Trombone. Number 5, Frank's Wild Years from 1987. A tidy album of wildly eclectic songs, ostensibly written for a musical play but bearing no sense of overarching narrative, one suspects that these songs were written in fact to go in the book for Waits' upcoming tour. Some of them are, despite this dubious provenance, some of Waits' greatest songs. Hang On St. Christopher, Cold Cold Ground, Innocent When You Dream, the Tony Bennett impersonation of Straight to the Top, Down in the Hole and Yesterday Are Here. Despite I'll Take New York threatening to Yellow Submarine the record, Frank's Wild Years is supremely enjoyable and perhaps the one Waits album you can listen to purely for the songs and not have to readjust your expectations. 4. Rain Dogs, 1985 You can't really think about Rain Dogs without thinking about Swordfish Trombone. While Rain Dogs does have a handful of great songs, more than most albums, it hunts with a shotgun, whereas Swordfish Trombone hunted with a crossbow. And while Ramble and Sprawl have their places, Rain Dogs seems to do so a little gratuitously, a little unnecessarily. Inevitably, it also lacks the glorious shock of the new that Swordfish Trombone had. Rain Dogs is a great, a five-star album, but Waits is an artist with 
four or five five-star albums in his swag and Rain Dogs, it turns out, is the least of them. I will say for it, however, that it's one of those albums that I can recall with absolute clarity. The first place, the first time, and who I was with when I first heard it. The Mule Variations from 1999 comes in at number three. Or Rain Dogs Volume 2. Or Rain Dogs as Craft with Swordfish Trombone's Attitude and Bone Machine's Sense of Adventure. Mule Variations is a vast collection of songs, while in many spots tremendous can be a little overwhelming in places. There are so many good songs here, all of which fit together perfectly. There's nothing new as such, but it's everything that's gone before cross-pollinated and pared down. It's a long album, but there's very little slack in it and the sequencing is impeccable. Number two is Swordfish Trombone from 1983. Would it be hyperbolic to suggest that no artist has reinvented themselves so completely or successfully as Waits did between the somewhat moribund Heart Attack and Vine and this album? Although we'd seen hints on Blue Valentines and Heart Attack and Vine, here on the angrier brother to Rain Dogs, he completely casts off the notion of jazz combo beat noodling and replaces it with a mad jumble of styles underpinned by eclectic, eccentric arrangements and crazed stories of screwballs, losers and ne'er-do-wells, hell-bent on skullduggery. Another factor is a change in locus for the songs. No longer the film noir world of LA, Waits was relocated to New York and peers at the stay behinds and the left behinds. Studded with great songs and fascinating diversions, Waits spent a year shopping the record to any label that would put it out. When they did, it was not so much a case of Tom Waits is back, but a case of Tom Waits is dead, long live Tom Waits. And number one is 1992's Bone Machine. A grim and gruesome dissection of mortality, death and rot Bone Machine does not set a foot wrong negotiating its dark and twisty path. Updating the 1980s Swordfish Trombone template with some edgy alt-rock production and arrangement techniques, some songs like Dirt in the Ground or All Stripped Down are so diaphanous or skeletal, they barely qualify as songs but are both in equal parts mesmerizing and arresting. No Waits album has ever hung together so well and used its strength to such advantage and given its experiments such a sympathetic environment in which to breathe. I understand this won't be a lot of people's choices Waits is best, but give it a chance and be prepared to be convinced, either by reason or by force. Tom Waits hasn't put out a record since 2011 and it doesn't look like he will anytime soon. He's achieved an awful lot across the 17 albums that we've had a look at perhaps as much as any cult figure from the 70s onwards. And he has done this by pursuing a singular vision and a flexible perception and context of himself as an artist. Anyway, I would value your thoughts on this list. I would treasure your comments. And I look forward to the next time we gather together in good company, provided the nasty YouTube police don't shut the channel down, and remind you... In the meantime, to stay righteous.